Hello, and welcome to Lab 5, the 3D maze. In this video, we will go over the purpose and background of this lab, how to do the lab, and just a few pointers to help you on your way. Part 1, Purpose and Background. The purpose of this lab is to not only create an awesome maze solver that can be adapted to solve any dimension of maze, but also to give you some practice with recursion. Recursion happens any time a function calls itself and can be useful in some circumstances. The background, or story behind the lab, is that you're out scuba diving with a programming friend when you encounter a large, boxed-shaped storage facility inside of a submarine on the ocean floor. The storage facility is composed of 10 foot by 10 foot by 10 foot cells, some of which are pathable and others are not. There is an entrance at the front upper left corner of the storage facility and an exit at the back lower right corner of the storage facility. You and your friend decide to whip out your laptops and begin to program an algorithm to find the shortest path through the maze. Part 2. How to do the lab. In this section, we will talk about the format of the maze files, how to make a random maze, how to make the maze into a string, how to import a maze, and finally, how to path through the maze. In this lab, there is a mazes folder which contains several maze files. Each of these files is either a valid file and has the correct format, or is an invalid file and has an incorrect format. All of the valid files should be made up of only ones and zeros. The files should be organized so that there are five numbers across and five numbers down and five groups of 25 numbers each. The zeros in the file represent an invalid path. The ones in the file represent a valid path. Valid mazes also start and end with a valid path, so they have a 1 in the 0, 0, 0 place and a 1 in the 4, 4, 4 place. In this video, we will assume and recommend that you store your maze in a three-dimensional array. For this function, we start by making a triple nested for loop. Each loop should go from 0 to 4, so each loop will run 5 times. Now we know that the innermost loop will be called 125 times one for each space in our array. From here, we can fill up our maze with random numbers between 0 and 1. To do this, we can use the rand function and mod by 2. After the for loops, we need to make this valid maze by setting spot 000 and 444 to 1. A valid maze does not need to be solvable. To make our array into a string, we will need to get the numbers from the array in the correct order and add appropriate spacing. To do this, we start by using the same three loops as mentioned previously, and instead of setting the value of the maze in the innermost for loop, we take the number at that position in the maze and put it into a string stream. To make sure we have correct spacing, we'll want to add new lines between every five numbers and an extra new line after every five rows of five numbers each. I'll leave this for you to figure out. Import maze is very similar to the previous two functions. It is also mostly comprised of a triple nested for loop. I'll leave the importing of the maze for you to figure out as well. Now we come to the fun part, recursively solving the maze. We recommend making a new recursive function that is called by your solve maze function. This function should return a boolean and take in three integers representing the x, y, and z coordinates. We will call this the find path function. We also recommend having a vector of strings as a private data member of the maze class. In this video, we will call this vector p. We will return p at the end of the solve maze function. We'll want to start by adding a string representation of x, y, and z to p, our vector of strings. Then, like all good recursive functions, find path should have a few base cases. Let's think about them for a moment. When would we not want to continue looking on our current path for the end of the maze? Perhaps if we're outside of the maze, are on an invalid path, or we've already been to this spot in our maze before. In any of these cases, we'd want to pop the coordinate that we stored in P off of our vector and return false. And of course, we can't forget that if we've reached the end of the maze, we should return true to indicate that we found the end of our maze. 
Then we have the recursive part of our function. In this part, we'll want to first mark that we've been to this spot in our maze. We do this by changing the one in our array to a two. When, then we check if we can move up, down, left, right, in, or out. We do this by calling find path on all of the squares surrounding our own. If any of those function calls return true, we know that we are on the right path. If none of them return true, then we are not on the path, and we can pop the coordinate we stored in our vector p off of p and return false. Okay, that was a lot of information, so let's run through how this works on an example maze. Our example maze is only two-dimensional, but our algorithm will work similarly on both 2D and 3D mazes. We start our function at the spot 0, 0, and run through our base cases. Are we outside of the maze? No. Are we on an invalid path? No. Have we already been to this spot in the maze? No. Are we at the end of the maze? No. In that case, we mark the spot by changing its value from 1 to 2 and check the surrounding spots. First, we check the spot above us. Are we outside of the maze? Yes. We return false. When we return false, this instance of the function ends. However, we are still in the middle of our first function call to the spot 0, 0. So we continue in that function from where we left off. We then check the spot beneath us. Are we outside of the maze? No. Are we on an invalid path? No. Have we been to this spot before? No. Are we at the end of the maze? No. So we mark this spot and check the surrounding spots. First, we check the spot above us. Are we outside of the maze? No. Are we on an invalid path? No. Have we already been to this spot in the maze? Yes. So we return false here and continue with the previous instance of the function. We then check the spot beneath us. Are we outside of the maze? No. Are we on an invalid path? No. Have we already been to the spot in the maze? No. Are we at the end of the maze? No. So we mark this spot and check the surrounding spots. First, we check the spot above us. Are we outside of the maze? No. Are we on an invalid path? No. Have we already been to this spot on the maze? Yes. So we return false here and continue with the previous instance of the function. We then check the spot beneath us. Are we outside of the maze? Yes. Return false. We check to our left. Are we outside of the maze? Yes. Return false. We check to our right. Are we outside of the maze? No. Are we on an invalid path? Yes. So we return false. None of our current surrounding squares are pathable, so we return false for this function and continue to our pre previous function call at the spot 0, 1. At this spot, we have already checked both up and down, so next we check left. Are we outside of the maze? Yes. Return false. Then we check to our right. You can see that by following this logic, we will eventually find that this is a valid path and will make it to the end of our maze. Once we've made it to the end, we hit our base case of being at the end and return true. This return true will return true back through all of our function calls. Part 3 tips and tricks. Use a triple nested array of ints or strings. Call srand in your constructor. If you change any number in your maze in the solve maze function, like we do in the example above or um, previously, be sure to reset them to their original value before returning. Use an IF stream to read from your files. You can use double angled brackets with your IF stream to remove the numbers in your file. That's all for this lab. If you have any questions, you can always come in and talk to the TAs. Good luck.